This is Derek Staley with ESF Fireworld here at the MLG Winter Championship, and I'm joined by Jeff in Control Robinson. So first of all, thank you for taking the time to come sit down with us. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Sure. Um, so let's talk about last year before we get into MLG. Uh, safe to say last year didn't quite go the way you wanted. Um, safe to say. At the same time, you grew into a more prominent community member, but because of that, you got a lot of backlash from your struggles as a player. Can you talk about dealing with that from the community side, but, uh, side of things? You know, my uh, perspective on this is ever-changing, but I think the place that I fall on it now is I'm thankful because – at the end of the day, while last year was as bumpy as it probably could get for a lot of players, um, a big part of the reason why it was such a topic of discussion was because people cared all year long. And um, the nice thing about that for me is as long as people do care, I will always have a chance to prove myself. I will always have the time to improve myself. Um, whereas other players, sometimes they only get that one shot and then no nobody really cares about them. They fall into obscurity. And they could be a better player than a lot of other people, myself included. Um, but if people aren't giving them the time of day, their resources are going to run out. They're not going to have the opportunity to be flown to a tournament that they otherwise couldn't send themselves. Um, they're not going to be able to reason and discuss their, uh, their shortcomings on a, on a public stage. And, of course, they're not going to have access to top-level commentary from other players. I'm hanging out with Stefano right now. I talked to Bling. Um, of course, Evil Geniuses field some of the best players out there as well. So um, while I did have a really tough time last year, I'm in a place where I can constantly strike gold. And... StarCraft, um, thankfully, is a difficult enough game where it's not so simple as being within close proximity of Huck and then all of a sudden you're good. It takes a lot more than that. So I always will consider myself a work in progress. But uh, of course, that being said, last year, I hope it goes the hell away, man. <laughs> uh, a lot of that criticism last year came uh, fairly or unfairly because they expected faster results from the EG house, both from you and your teammates. Uh, do you feel that the EG house has been a success, and can you talk about that criticism a little bit? Yes. Um, the EG house is absolutely a success just in its own right. Of course, what it does is, again, it acts as a lightning rod. It says, hey, look at EG. We're taking StarCraft II very serious, and now you're going to talk about us across the board. And that's, of course, uh, there's the saying, there's no bad press. Um, if, if, if people are talking about EG and the results, good or bad, they're talking about EG, which, of course, puts eyes on our sponsors. It gives us, again, more attention, more limelight, more uh, coverage, which is just very attractive. So as long as we have people not saying racist things, uh, on their stream, then it's actually good press. Um, so uh, just like if I'm doing the pure pragmatic defense, I would say on that own right, it's of course beneficial. But going more into the line by line of it, um, it takes a while, as Artosis said. A lot of Koreans actually don't even evaluate your skill until you've been in a house for a year. EG in the Western scene doesn't have that experience with houses. So it was kind of like, wow, EG's got a house. I expect results two weeks from now. And then when it's a month, they're like, hmm, still not seeing those results. Two months, three months, four. But now we're at kind of that five, six month um, range, and it's starting to look a lot more positive. It's looking a lot more beneficial. There's EG practice, which is being streamed. The Muslims turning out results. Um, I myself feel like I'm playing much better this year in 2012. Um, so we're looking for more of those kind of things. So uh, last year you also did a lot of casting. You did some NASL, uh, EGMC, things like that. Um, I know you want to move forward now with the playing, but obviously because uh, everything's, like you said, going better. But was there a point last year where it ever crossed your mind that maybe that was the career path that would be better for you? Um, it crossed my mind in the sense that, like, if I say purple dinosaur right now, it's crossing your mind. Um, it never was something where I considered, like, gosh, playing is really not working out for me. I want to do that. Um, like we've talked about, last year was very difficult for me. I sucked a lot of ass, <laughs> uh, for all intents and purposes. And uh, there was, of course, a lot of people speculating, like, you do more good as a commentator. You're probably not enjoying this. But, of course, every time I was asked, um, I'm still a player. I'm still a competitor. And... Even if I'm the butt of your joke, I'm the guy getting paid to play this game, and I'm enjoying it. So as long as I can do those things and, and feel a sense of uh, fulfillment and, and continue to do that, I will always do that. That being said, um, I love StarCraft II so thoroughly that I actually get a lot of pleasure out of being on both ends of that. I like commentating. I like playing. I like coaching. It's a big passion for me as well. Um, of course, you have to find that balance or lack thereof in terms of things that aren't playing. And I think that's what I'm doing right now. I'm coaching one hour a day as opposed to like the five or six I did last year. I'm not going to move to California away from my friends, family, and players um, to do casting for 10 hours a day. That's, that's, that's done for now. Um, I want to play because you can't reverse it. I can't cast now and then go back to playing a couple years from now. I can play now and go to casting in a couple years. So as long as this is beneficial for my mind, body, and soul, I'm going to be doing it. And then eventually I'd like to fall back on casting. So as you mentioned, you've done a lot of both. That kind of gives you a unique perspective compared to most people in the scene. Uh, something that's come up occasionally is that a lot of casters end up getting more attention than the players do. So people like Day9, Tasteless, Cortosis are more popular than almost every player. Uh, what are your thoughts on that situation? It's a fascinating situation. It really is. Um, it, it actually goes even further than casters. It's like it's, it's a streamer situation where 
There's a lot of fantastic streamers, namely Koreans, but also some other top non-Koreans. And if you check their stream, they've got you know an amazing peak of like 1,100 when players that are comparatively worse than them, and I can throw myself under that bus for me, uh, they're averaging three, four, five thousand 5,000 people. And uh, do I think that's wrong? No, I don't. I think people are, I mean, the proof's in the pudding, right? There's no way to say that that's wrong. It's a, a subjective thing. But it does seem a little bit um, shiny lights grab people. And of course, uh, casters always have that opportunity. It's impossible for Day9 to have a, I mean, what is he going to do to mess up a cast, right? Like he says, liquid huck three times, and people are like, oh, Day9. But if somebody, you know, misplaces a pylon and, and Fs up their foregate, it's not, oh, oh, Huck, it's like, wow, you newbie, and then everyone goes attacking them. So um, for commentators, it's always on the up and up, whereas for players, it's, it's up, down, plateau, up, down, you know, whatever it is. Um, so what I think is really important and a very important initiative for a lot of people is things like ESFI doing a fantastic job grabbing players, giving them that attention. But also for us as players, or myself included, as a guy who's a little bit more popular, when I'm streaming, you know, tell somebody else, hey, go check out that stream. They're a really great player. Or when I tweet, this guy's really cool. You guys should all check out his. Like, we need to kind of work within ourselves, even though they're competitors technically, and even though um, they might not be on my team, them benefiting helps me because this community needs to get bigger and stronger and support more players that can go professional so that we can actually have a legitimate scene. Right now, it's, uh, I mean, how many players are making a living wage? You know, EG has the most highly paid players, I think, on the market. And if people knew all our salaries, they'd be very impressed with it within the esports world. But if I then went and told like a stockbroker, they'd, they'd laugh their asses off because we're not legitimate yet. Um, and we need to have more people at, at that level rising as a group so that we can kind of make the entire scene better. So speaking of casting, uh, you tentatively announced that you'd be going back to Korea at some point this year to train, as well as cast a little bit of Code A. Uh, can you give some details on that, how that came together, and when you might be going? Yeah. Um, so basically what happened is a long time ago, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's no mystery. If you want to get much better, one of the best places you can simply send yourself is Korea. Um, EG has the benefit of being partnered with Slayers. So we have a house there. Um, I've been friends with Artosis for as long as some of these players have been alive, so I could go stay at his house. He offered me to do that. So that was kind of in the works, and I figured um, if I'm going to spend my own dime to send me to Korea and spend that time there, it's really important that I maximize my time. So of course there comes that duality where I'm both a player and a commentator from time to time. And I reached out to Artosis a la gum, and I said, hey, uh, I'm going to be in town. I, I, I can make it extended. I'd love to commentate. And they were very excited about the idea. Um, but it was always under the, pre uh, the premises that maybe it can't work out, actually. So it got to the level where Gom was like, yeah, sure. And me being the excitable guy I am, I was like, yay, maybe I'm going to do it. But then I went to my team, and we talked about it, and it just actually doesn't work out. So that's the unfortunate thing I have to, I have to report now. And that's just because um, with the Masters Cup, we're a little bit shorthanded for someone made some big mistake. Um, we're a little bit shorthanded there, so we, we need all hands on deck. And the Masters Cup, of course, is an amazing opportunity for our team to broadcast our sponsors. And if you take me out of the picture, it, it puts more stress on everybody else. Um, so that's the big reason why I'm going to have to hang back for at least this time. But it is absolutely within my interest to put my name out there as much as I possibly can, because that's what players have to do to survive. And if I can do that on the GOM stage, MLG, IPL, all those kind of things, I'm going to try to do that. But for right now, I have to say I'm sticking at home to make sure EG is OK. OK, so as you mentioned, you have shown uh, signs of improvement this year. You took series off Thorzane at Home Story Cup. Uh, you beat Sleep at Lone Star Clash. H how do you feel overall about your play right now and where you're at? You know, I, I, feel, really, I feel really good. Um, this tournament. Like last year, I ended with just the weight of the world on my shoulders as far as I, I was concerned. I was really, really fed up with my own performance, and I was trying as hard as I could. But of course, a lot like bent, uh, or weightlifting, actually, if you try too hard and do too much, there's a certain point where your muscles are like, enough already. We can't do it anymore. So I feel like that accumulated at Providence. I had a really bad performance. I, and, and results aside, it was just how I played. I played terribly. Results, of course, followed. But um, that was a really bad low point for me. 2012, it started off a little bit more casual because, of course, over November and December, um, a lot of players, because there's no tournaments during that time, go see their family. They take a little bit of breather and they recoup. Um, Home Story Cup was nice because I was around a lot of players who were able, like, very small things. Like JWP coached me for a few games, and that was really important for my PVZ. Um, Sock saw me trying to defend a one-on-one -on -one and build probes at the same time, and, and he simply said, "Don't build probes," and he like walked away as the caped crusader that he is now. Um, and those little things started to help me. So it translated into beating Thorzane and, and doing OK against Nurchio for one game. I mean, Nurchio's a really good player. Um, and then from there, of course, again, the next tournament would be Lone Star, where, like you said, I beat Sleep. And I'm really happy with that. Um, uh, it, those are nice. Those are OK, you know? But uh, at the end of the day, I don't want to be like, man, in 2012, 
I can go through each tournament and talk about that one best of three I won against a pretty good player. Like that's not that's still not where I want to be. So um, I'm comfortable because I can see the prog the progress in myself. Um, and as long as I can continue to see that and feel like um, I'm starting to compete with better named players, I think the results will follow. Uh, I was really calm in this in, at, at MLG. I didn't like bug out or nerve out. Um, I made a couple mistakes against Binsky Light, but uh, outside of that, I actually played quite well. Um, of course, I did go carriers against a guy who I thought was dead, and that was really stupid. But <laughs> outside of that, I'm, I'm playing pretty well. So I, I'm happy. There's a lot of terms ahead of us. So speaking of uh, MLG, obviously. Uh, you got knocked out by Binksy, as you said. Um, do you consider this event a success just because you continue to see improvement, or were there goals you had as far as how far you wanted to get in the tournament? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know that I call this tournament a success. Um, not not on the the pure player level. I don't I don't walk away from this and say, you know, beating Clash Panther was a was a good tournament for me, and um, kind of doing okay against Symbol and kind of doing okay against Bin Binsky is okay. That's not it. Um, what does give me hope is that my mindset I felt like was a lot better. Um, in, in games past, I've been like, I'll have that voice in my head that's like, well, what are the people going to say if you lose this one? Or what are you going to do if you win? Or what are you going to do if you lose? That voice is really bad. Um, this tournament, I was, I, was pretty, I was pretty focused and I was doing pretty well. And I, I, and I controlled my emotions very well. So I think that is a success. The results, no. Um, and I, I, I really wish like, the arena was two weeks from now because I'm, I'm feeling like I need to get going. Um, but of course, we're just going to hit that whiteboard and keep uh, working on my play. But to answer your question in the lo most long-winded way possible, no, it wasn't a success. But there was some positives I can take away from it. You mentioned the arena. Uh, MLG made some pretty dramatic changes this year. You were involved in some controversy on that, not really know doing your own. But you were locked into groups for most of the last year. Uh, how do you feel about the new format? It's a lot better. I mean, I, the big thing about that is that, that storyline is not interesting or good for the community. So we should not be talking about in control, locked into groups, and continuing to conti continuing to be there after a one good performance in Dallas. We should be talking about, wow, that new group is so exciting, it's filled with great players, or cool, it's Marine King Dong Ragu, the rematch from the uh, Winter Arena. You know, Those are the storylines that further the game and make everything better. And I think MLG is going along the right path. Of course, they still have extended series, so MLG still is making mistakes. But outside of that, pretty good. Uh, you mentioned the extended series. Is there anything else you'd like to see change about the format right now? Or are you pretty happy with it outside of that rule? I'm really happy with outside of that. And I think the problem with that is, unfortunately, it's kind of a root issue. Like, from that goes the fact that if I lose, or if I beat somebody and then lose further down the line, those people come up behind me. So they're disadvantaged, of course, through the extended series. But also, you don't want to go to a tournament and face the same, like, four people, potentially. You want to diversify so that you can talk about those results, see your play. And of course, give yourself a better chance in a tournament. The more shots you have, like if I if I hit just a rock wall player and he knocks me in the loser bracket, and I win a few rounds, and then that player loses to someone even better, I'm I'm out from one guy. And that's that. I, I don't know. There's of course differing opinions, but for me, I don't like that. So when you come to these events, obviously there's other things other than just playing, even though that's the main reason you're here. Um, can you talk about some of the other enjoyable things, whether it's just interacting with fans or whether it's you know talking to other pro top players and learning things about your game? You know, there's there's so much good about these tournaments, and I'm so thankful. Like, this is a huge audience. It's it's gargantuan. Um, a lot of a lot of fans come up, and they and they, they this is not like, and hopefully it never gets there. But we're not at the point yet where we're getting heckled or attacked. It's actually just pure positivity. I've, I I have nothing but people coming up and saying, "Here's what I like about you. Thank you so much." And then they go away and they tweet, "Wow, this person's so great. And it was so fun." And, and like that's that kind of stuff circles around you and insulates you from a lot of the negativity you experience online. And again, it's not to give too much attention to the bad apples, but it's very easy for a player to play a tournament, lose at some point or another, and then to, to bear the criticisms from everyone. I, I, I see Nurchio getting hate, for God's sakes. And let's go on record. Nobody should give hate to Nurchio, for God's sakes. He wins almost everything. But um, it does happen. So the positivity is really nice, meeting the fans. But then also, I'm goofing around and joking around with a lot of my buddies, but I'm also sharing really, like, Stefano and I were just sitting in the audience watching these matches, and we're talking about it. And he's pointing out things that I don't know otherwise. And that's, oh, that is so critical. That's so important. And that's one of the big alienating factors for a lot of people. Like, um, if they don't have that relationship with other top players, then maybe they catch it in a show or maybe they see it in a VOD. But unless it's explained to them at some point or another, that learning process isn't expedited like it is for me. And I'm very fortunate that way. So these terms are very important. When you're looking at uh, evaluating games like that, right now, you know, you have Terran players complaining a lot about TVP. Do you even think about the balance of the game right now, or do you mostly just worry about improving your matchups? You have to do the best you can to put that out of your mind. Um, the very state of the game right now is that there are going to be patches, there are going to be changes, um, but probably more reliable is that there's going to be map changes. So maps constantly are being introduced, removed, and so on and so forth. 
And there's going to be imbalanced maps. There's going to be advantaged maps. And there's going to be maps that introduce like different tactics in metagame. And we can't spend too much time worrying about how that, like, if we step back and look at the, the whole world view. Because our job is to win that one game. So of course it's on the back of all our minds. But the players that allow it to go up towards the front of their mind and then dominate their thought process, those are the ones that are getting clouded and distracted. I try as best I can to go into every matchup, be it PvP, PvT, or PvZ, and say, I have a chance to win, and here's how I'm going to do it. With that in mind, uh, how comfortable are you with your three different matchups right now? Um, I really like PvT. I feel like um, one of the big advantages for me is that Demuslim is a fantastic teacher, and I feel like he's not selfish with his knowledge. So although I am a competitor for him in a lot of tournaments, he has no problem pushing me to the, my top potential um, and, and allowing me to represent him and, and our team much better. So. I feel like PvT, I understand it quite well, and it's a lot, largely in part because of Demuslim and his uh, generosity. PvZ right now, I've kind of made a shift. I used to be um, a much more like three-base macro kind of Protoss player. Of course, a lot of people cite my opening, which is a little bit gimmicky, and of course there is that. Um, but then lately, I've switched back to a little bit more of the MC slash, I guess name was not doing it as much, but he used to do a two-base Colossus timing that I really like. Um, I think it exploits a lot of what the Zergs are trying to do right now. And it gives me the best chance of winning. Um, and I think the proof's in the pudding. I was able to take two games pretty easily against Sleep, who then went on to dominate every other Protoss. And the funny thing about that, too, is if you get a chance to watch those replays, do, do watch them. Because a lot of people were talking about how I can rush him to win. Can rush has actually hurt me both times, which were, um, makes me look a little bit silly as I'm sitting here being like, All right, yeah, my opening's pretty cool. Like, sometimes it's not. So uh, I was able to overcome that and smash him with two good timings, even though he was benef uh, he was a emboldened by my cannon rush. So um, I feel pretty good about that. And then PvP, uh, I mean, I'll tell you what. I watch Huck play PvP, and I, I look at a guy, and I think he's got just balls of steel, because I feel like he's taking just giant risks. But of course, he's making reads and decisions that um, I'm just not familiar with quite yet. So I feel like that's my most um, uh, like adolescent matchup. I'm not there yet. I'm not developed well. I can win, but if I do, it's not because I like understood it better and dominated my opponent. It was because the stars aligned nicely for me. So that's the matchup I feel like I need to work on the most. I feel quite soft in that matchup. So moving past the balance a little bit, we do have Heart of the Swarm on the horizon, hopefully at some point this year. Uh, what changes would you like to see in the game to make it a better competitive game? You know, uh, the first place I always start is the U UI, user interface. Um, I, I really want replay sharing. They're uh, like one of my life goals at this point. It was recently realized again, because I want to like meet Dustin Browder in a dark alley or something like that, and really ask him the hard question, why? Just simply why? And I know the answer is already going to be like we haven't had time or we just didn't prioritize it, and that'll make me scream towards the heavens and you know throw a sword or something like because that's just ridiculous. It's there's so much benefit to it. Of course, I'll rant later, but um, that would be the first place I'd start. Better chat, which it seems like they're going to do in this next patch. They were talking about that. There is the ghost town effect of, of Battle.net, um, and then as far as balance goes, <laughs> almost everything they talked about needs to go, man. Like if I can mass recall off my next eye, if I if there's a shredder out there, if uh, like the Swarm Host looks okay, or Swarm Lord, or whatever it is, that looks okay. Um, the Tempest is a joke. Like, give the carrier a shot. Let's let's tweak it. Let's change it. Get it back to the Brood War style, where you can micro it for better effect. Um, those are the things I want to see. The Battle Hellion seems ridiculous. Um, the Goliath going in. I, those kind of things. I just don't like the direction of it. Of course, um, you could actually pull up videos of me doing the same day saying about heart, um, Wings of Liberty, and it turned out okay. I'm pretty damn happy with the game. I'm obsessed with it, obviously. So. Um, here's hoping they're right and I'm wrong again. But from, from this perspective, I'm really worried. Also on the horizon, uh, it does seem like we had uh, Mike Warheim over in Korea talking to OGN. Uh, so it seems like StarCraft II Pro League is coming. How do you fee see that impacting the scene, both in Korea as well as internationally? Gosh, uh, I feel like Chicken Little, you know, talking about the sky falling. Uh, I really hope, again, I'm wrong, but my gut instinct is, is scared. I think Kespa has proven in the past that they are pretty power hungry and they're willing to do things like monopolize players and leagues. They really bullied GOM around back in the day with Brood War. They, they told teams if they participate in GOM leagues they'll be punished within KESPA and that's just those kind of tactics does not make sense to the rest of the world. In Korea it's, it's a little bit how business is done so that's just very unfortunate. Um, they took over 50 percent of winnings from players within their own league that they're handing out prizes. So it's basically like announcing $60,000 prize and then actually giving them 30. Which is like, if that doesn't if that doesn't boil your blood, then you're biased or something. Like you're crazy. Like that's that's terrible. So those kind of practices should be checked back by the relationship with Blizzard, um, and I hope that's the case. 
Uh, and, and as long as they're like, hey, we're this new league, we want to inject more money into it, our, our image, our vision, but people can choose between the two and it's just more content, I am pleased as peaches, man. I'm so glad. That'd be great. But if they're like, yeah, we're coming in and, you know, you better watch your butts because we're going we're gonna to take you out, then, I mean, that's, that's how it goes sometimes, but I'm just kind of worried about the tactics they pulled. I see Flash and Jadon coming into StarCraft 2. That's going to be a big explosion of excitement, much like Nod and Boxer. But then I, I do think that uh, Kespa will leverage them, and they've done it in really bad ways in the past. Governments were involved, or Korea, the Korean government was involved to intimidate players. There's a lot of history that I think StarCraft II um, fans don't know about, and I would encourage them to educate themselves so that they can make their own opinion as well. Assuming we, uh, Blizzard does make Kespa play nice, uh, how do you see the players coming over impacting it? Do you think, like some people are assuming, that guys like Flash and Jay Dong, as great as they were in Brood War, are going to be able to completely dominate StarCraft II? I think the Brood War pros, pros will be fantastic. They're going to be amazing. Um, I asked actually Nesty himself, I said, will they be, you know, the most dominant things ever? And he said in three months they'll be very, very good, you know, towards the top. And I think everyone would predict that. Um, I think the nice thing for us is that Korea hasn't really gotten on board with StarCraft II just yet. But if you take the big name Brood War pros that still exist right now and move them towards StarCraft II, I think there's a very good chance that Korea makes that transition as well. And with Korea on board, um, you're going to start seeing things like 30,000 people outside um, watching a StarCraft II match. Things that we saw in Brood War, we're not quite seeing yet in StarCraft II. Um, and that's the shot in the arm it could need to excel it to all of a sudden ESPN's like, well, what the hell are you guys doing? And, and MTV's doing stupid documentaries on everybody and that kind of stuff. But for right now, um, I really do think it'll be a good thing in that regard. I, like I said, I'm just kind of worried about the business side of things. And as long as Blizzard can play the middleman really well, then it should be okay. Looking at forward in 2012, the rest of the year, what do you need to do to what do you need to accomplish really in order for this year to be considered a success for you as a player? That's a really good question. Um, I, I think it sounds extremely lofty for me to say this, but if we're doing that game where you ask a question, and I give my knee-jerk response, and that's what I feel, then my answer is I need to win a tournament. Is that an MLG? Again, maybe that's really freaking lofty, um, and people can make fun of me and, and laugh, but that is that's where I'm going with this. I, I, I don't want to be the like fourth place Dallas. Oh, who cares? Koreans weren't there, right? <laughs> um, am I capable of doing it? Absolutely not right now. You know, it, the, again, I'm losing to Binsky Light. He's a great player, but he's not, uh, he's not Pult Prime. He's not um, Marine King. So I, I've got a ways to go, um, but I've got a year in front of me. I've got a lot of tournaments. The house is really starting to kick in right now. Um, EG's, you know, just really committed and working on doing excellent things in that way, and I want to be a part of that. So that's my goal. If I fall short, am I going to cut my wrists and, you know, listen to emo music and stuff? No, probably not, but I will definitely always work towards that. And no offense to emo music listening people. <laughs> All right, Jeff, thank you once again for your time. Uh, any last words, shout out sponsors, anything like that? Go ahead. Well, just thank you to you guys. Uh, ESFI is really like, um, I, mean, I mean, a while ago, one of the things I said that was missing from esports was really good uh, journalism. And I think you guys have actually picked up the pace and done a great job with that and filled a void that hasn't been there yet. I'm really excited you're asking me for my advice on things, or not advice, but my word on things. Wow, let's give myself too much credit here. Um, so thank you to you guys. Of course, my sponsors, Intel, SteelSeries, Kingston HyperX, Monster, Sapphire, Six Pool Gaming, and Beyond Gaming, all those guys that make it possible for me to sit here and talk about this and compete on this level. It's very, very awesome. Um, my fiance Anna, thank you very much. And just everybody who came to MLG Columbus, Anaheim, they're going to be making some big announcements. It's going to be pretty freaking ridiculous. But if you haven't been to an MLG, please go. And uh, I'll see everybody soon. All right, thank you. Thank you.